All right, hi everybody. Uh, are you ready for part two of the back-to-back -back background processing uh, talks? Yes, and are you also ready for lunch? Yeah, that got a bigger crowd, a big, bigger cheer, all right. Um, Thanks for, thanks for sticking with us and for doing some more background processing stuff. Before we start, just a quick question. How many people actively use background processing today? Wow, that's more than I thought. How many are thinking about adding it but haven't yet? Okay, wow. So that's, that looked like 60% already use it and it's going to grow more and more. So this is exciting. I'm glad it's a, a good relevant talk to a lot of people. Uh, so my name is Carl. Uh, the talk here today is called Background Processing, an Unexpectedly Long Journey, because that's basically what our team encountered. Uh, the subtitle of this talk is inspired by the subtitle of The Hobbit, uh, which in itself was an unexpectedly long movie uh, from a book that was pretty short. Uh, so, you know, give it some branding. There we are. Uh, another reason I chose The Hobbit is because in our talk there will be dragons. Uh, but there will be no Benedict Cumberbatch voiceover, unfortunately. My name is Carl Becker. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Third Iron. Uh, Third Iron is a company that creates technology for libraries. Uh, so don't think code libraries, think academic libraries, think the libraries that you didn't know existed at hospitals uh, or at big companies as well. Uh, the product we make is called Browse. And browsing lets researchers keep up to date with peer-reviewed academic journals. Uh, and of course, that means a lot of researchers at universities, professors, uh, uh, you know, master's degree students, PhD students, uh, but also uh, other folks, uh, such as doctors, nurses, uh, anyone in the healthcare industry is keeping up to date with things like New England Journal of Medicine, Cell, uh, a variety of other journals. So we make it easy to stay up to date with it. We have hundreds of different libraries and companies and groups all around the world uh, that subscribe to Browse. -E. Here's what the iOS app looks like of Browse. -E. And once you identify your institution, let's say you're you know, a doctor at Johns Hopkins, tap into Johns Hopkins, then we show you, hey, here's some of the high level uh, areas of journals that we have in our system. Uh, we do not uh, show, like if it's Johns Hopkins, we probably wouldn't be showing, say, engineering, well, maybe not uh, mathematics and statistics, or maybe not law and legal studies, because Johns Hopkins might not subscribe to a lot of those journals. They're subscribing mostly to biomed and health. So, uh, you know, whatever you're interested in, you tap into it, though. You get a list of journals eventually in the middle screen there, and then on the right, once you tap on your favorite journal, you get to see the latest table of contents. Uh, and that shows like the newest articles for a journal, which is typically what researchers are mostly interested in, uh, at least right away. Uh, we also have user customization features where you can put your favorite journals onto something we call My Bookshelf, and then you see all, all those red dots with uh, ridiculously large numbers. Uh, those are the number of unread articles in those journals. So, for instance, Nature has 5,103 unread articles. Uh, I have not kept up to my reading uh, in the journal Nature. Uh, but if we, for instance, tapped on Expert Systems, the name of another journal, uh, it would bring up the latest table of contents and show blue dots beside all the articles we have not read yet. Uh, so it's a lot like an RSS reader or an email client in that way. Our primary goal for doing background processing had to do with those blue dots, uh, specifically to get notifications to users to say, hey, there's new articles available for you to read in your favorite journals. Uh, it, it doesn't inundate the user with like new articles in every single journal in the universe. It's just that user customization uh, aspect, like what are, what are the handful of favorite journals in the world that you want to follow? So we show, you know, hey, there's new articles available for you. Uh, we also did the same thing in Android, and I gave a talk about that earlier this year. Uh, and I think I could find it online somewhere, but uh, the Android implementation very different, but still very challenging, uh, just like the iOS implementation was challenging. So to keep with the Hobbit theme, this was basically the thing we're trying to get. We want to get notifications. That's the goal that is being kept by the dragons. But when you see, oh, notifications, that's what you're doing, then maybe why don't we do push notifications? And it was a really pragmatic reason. Our backend team was pretty busy with other stuff. Uh, and the iOS and Android folks had a little bit more bandwidth, and there weren't as many pressing things for us to do. So I thought, oh, cool. Let's look at it. Like, maybe this is possible. 
and we all thought on the native app side, like, yeah, it shouldn't be too difficult to get this up and running in a basic form, and then we'll test it, and that'll be kind of it, right? Uh, we also found a secondary goal as we were talking about why we wanted to do background processing rather than, say, push notifications or something else, uh, and it's to eliminate the loading screen. This pops up for usually just a couple seconds or less, depending on uh, you know, internet connection, but the less loading screens, the better. And if we can load some stuff in the background, we could hopefully eliminate the screen entirely. So how did it go? It went pretty well. Uh, we got our notification done and working quite quickly. Uh, we started working on it a little bit before 360 IDEV 2017, and I remember being out in the hall during one of the talks, uh, talking to my teammates about uh, kind of putting some of the finishing touches on this. But we didn't ship it until early February. What went wrong between, you know, September and February? Uh, that's what we'll talk about. Uh, so that was the time to develop. Like, it really wasn't that different than kind of a typical change. The blue bar is like a typical software change that kind of did an average of, of what we do. Uh, but the testing phase, that's where things got really long in the two uh, I did the, the quick analysis, like our background processing was, was, it took over five times of what a typical feature or change that we make, uh, that we take the time to test, like it just took forever to test. So why did it take so long? One of them is that our world, uh, our use case is a little bit different than some other apps uh, in that our real world use case takes a long time. Uh, imagine if you were writing something that uh, consumed tweets and wanted to show notifications and background process stuff for tweets. You'd have tweets coming at you constantly, every minute of every day, depending on how many people you're following. Uh, this is our world, though. The world of academic journals, because science and uh, just research in general takes a long time to vet and properly you know, get out into the world in a uh, peer-reviewed fashion, uh, it doesn't come as fast and furious at you as tweets. So some journals, like the ones on Thursday there, uh, those come out every week, and there's a lot of articles that come out from that journal every week. But then other journals might come once a month, and sometimes even once a quarter or less. So this is a very indicative schedule of like someone who has a handful of journals they're interested in. There could be you know, a whole week where nothing, nothing came out. And then hopefully at the end of those six or seven days, our notification fires, that our background processing did its thing and it fired. That was the, one of the biggest things we were nervous about. Will that work when a tablet or a phone is just kind of sitting idle for a while? Because that is a real use case. Some of our users have an iPad that maybe they were given by the university and they don't really know why they got it, but they like our app and it makes it easier to read journals, but it just sits quietly most of the time. So we had to test that real world use case with it. Uh, also platform differences. That was the thing I was talking about uh, one year ago today in the hallway, was we got kind of the first version of the notifications working on both Android and iOS, and we showed it to our product owner, and the product owner said, ah, these look a little different than I expected. You know, it's just kind of uh, not exactly the same, not quite what he had in mind, uh, partially because the product owner generally uses a phone on one of the platforms and not the other one. Uh, so just make sure that you talk about user experience as far as notifications on both the iOS and Android side if you have a cross-platform app. Which, by the way, how many people work on a cross-platform app? Okay, cool. Uh, and also, how many people use the term product owner at your workplace? All right. Oh, pretty much everybody. Great. Good. <laughs> But now here's the first instance of a dragon, and I'm putting this sassy dragon animoji up here to represent Apple being uh, a, a fun partner in all of this background processing stuff. Uh, because they just made some really big changes. Uh, if you saw any of the WWDC talks, uh, there's a really good Mac Rumors article on it that showed some of the visuals uh, for like how notifications will change for end users. Uh, you can check those out, but you know what? You're at a conference, so it'd be even better if you checked out Kaya's talk on Wednesday at 11.30, uh, and she's gonna talk about all, all the new stuff in iOS 12. Uh, and I will be there, so hope to see you there. Uh, and of course, you were hopefully uh, just here for Agnes's talk. Uh, if you missed it, check it out when the videos come out. There's also a really good blog post 
uh, that you can, if, if you missed anything in the slides, check out that blog post and help pop these slides up so you can click in all the links to. So another reason why background processing took a little while, the testing portion, was iOS 9. And hopefully, how many people are supporting iOS 9? That's a good number of hands going up, like as in not many at all. <laughs> uh, great. Hopefully then just continue down that route if you can. Don't support iOS 9. It's just a little harder to do. Uh, we were stuck with it though yeah, for a variety of reasons, so uh, yeah. But now here come the dragons. Here were the things that we didn't really anticipate, uh, a variety of them that we didn't fully anticipate as we were getting into this. Uh, just background processing scheduling. By the way, throw a tomato and raise your hand as I talk if like Agnes totally covered one of these things in, in great depth. Uh, but hopefully some of this stuff is uh, The first big thing that I find really entertaining is Apple's docs say that there's no guarantee that the system will give your app any time to perform a background fetch. None. You might not get to run in the background at all. So, you know, keep that in mind. Don't put something that is absolutely critical to your app. Uh, do the processing in the foreground uh, because you're never going to do that. But now how about some more like concrete help uh, and things to look out for. Uh, the first thing is to be memory thrifty. Uh, just reduce the amount of RAM that you're using all the time. That's always a good thing to do. But especially uh, when you're loaded up in the app, uh, just keep the footprint as small as you can. Uh, there's really no concrete guidelines for how small is small, so just the less the better. Uh, find it out experimentally. That's going to be like the theme throughout this is you're going to have to test it a lot and find things out experimentally. Uh, what we did, uh, two things we did. One is that we trimmed what we loaded when the background app, when, when the app launched in the background. Uh, we just loaded a lot less stuff. Uh, it was a pretty significant refactor because a lot of that code we had just sort of let sit since the app started. Uh, so it was like five-year-old code that we had to carefully cut around. Uh, but once we did that and also reduced our network calls on startup, uh, RAM usage dropped quite a bit, and the app was not getting killed randomly uh, in the background as much. So we got to do the work that we wanted to do. Also, be accurate and quick when your app is running in the background. Uh, when you're running, and specifically we're using the background fetch API, uh, there's a completion handler that's called, uh, that, that is sent to you. You should call that completion handler when you're all done with your background processing uh, and make sure to say an accurate result. If you got results, say it. And if you didn't get results, say that too. Uh, if you take too long though, uh, you know, you may just get launched less frequently. And again, how long is too long? You're just kind of going to have to trial and error a lot. Be responsible with the CPU when you're in the background. Uh, the, this is kind of an older doc from Apple, but I think everything still very much applies. Just don't do view logic uh, when you're in the background. There's no need for it. Uh, they had specifically called out OpenGL ES, which, uh, you know, okay. Uh, but just don't update views and do as little work as possible. Use background task. Uh, we had so we have an asynchronous operation to run. We go out, we fetch some data, we pull it down, we process it. Uh, pretty standard stuff. Uh, but we were noticing that a lot of our test devices, especially older ones, uh, just weren't running it reliably. And even the ones that were running reliably did not launch it nearly as frequently as we wanted it to. Uh, we wanted to launch roughly once an hour, do a quick server ping, and go away. And it was taking like, maybe it would launch once a day, if not once every other day. Uh, so once we started using background tasks, that kind of solved, it was sort of a, a silver bullet in some ways for getting our app to be running uh, on the schedule that we were hoping that it would. Uh, reducing the amount of RAM definitely helped, and then this was like the next biggest thing, I think, that helped. Eskimo has a really good Apple forum post that talks about some of the intricacies and the uh, eccentricities, perhaps, of uh, background tasks. Another thing to keep in mind when you're in the background, uh, actually, how many people have this sort of if statement in their app that are doing background fetch right now? Does anyone check to see if their app is in the background when this function gets called? Maybe one? All right. You might want to add this. Uh, if you don't have negative side effects, 
great. Um, you don't need this if statement. But we did notice that our app was getting the background fetch function call even while we were in the foreground. Uh, and there's no reason for you to do extra work, probably. So uh, you know, might just want to fix it out. And of course, just also consider sort of the opposite, where someone might tap your app uh, icon when your app is running in the background. Just make sure that you don't uh, you know, trip over yourself as the app is uh, loading up and doing stuff in the background. Uh, watch out for force close, since a lot of you are already doing background processing. You're probably very familiar with this. Uh, that you know, if you're testing it, just do not swipe the app closed because then your background processing uh, won't run. Uh, so keep that in mind. And yes, I looked it up. It's called force close. I never knew that that was actually the term that uh, Alex force close to swipe it up. Also, beware of Xcode run. I think this was uh, in Agnes's talk. So you know, just tap the app icon. Don't run it from Xcode. Another thing we found out was airplane mode and Wi-Fi only, uh, background processing generally was not running in this situation. Uh, has anyone seen it run in this situation specifically? OK, because we couldn't really find any good documentation about it. Uh, but again, this was one of those things where testing took a couple extra days because one of our testers had this very valid scenario on their iPad um, or, or phone or something. Uh, and we didn't know why things weren't firing uh, until we actually like kind of looked. Oh, airplane mode. Maybe that has something to do with it. Uh, I should also say we're a fully remote team at Third Iron, so we also weren't able to just kind of lean over, look at their phone, and go, "Oh, airplane mode's on." Uh, you know, so just something to keep in mind. Like this does impact how background works. Also remember this in the settings app. Uh, it can be toggled on and off by users. You can check it, so definitely check that. Uh, put up alerts as needed if you really want that background processing. Uh, we've also seen it disabled fully on some devices. I, I'm not exactly sure what, what the latest is on that, but uh, we did see it fully just grayed out, but you couldn't turn it on for certain ones. And it's just not fun for your QA team. Background processing, at least for, you know, reliably, you know, are things firing every hour on the hour? No, you'll never be able to confirm that. It's just very tricky. Uh, this is the only non-Dragon or Lord of the Rings themed image in here, I think. But it's pretty apt. <laughs> but you don't have to take my word for any of this. Take Eskimo's word for it from the Apple Developer Forums. Uh, he's uh, got a couple really good tidbits, I thought. Uh, one of them just kind of lays it down in this forum post that it is tricky to test. Uh, kind of wish we would have known this before we, you know, were estimating some of some of the schedule that this might potentially take. Uh, but you know, the algorithm it uses is complex. So, to repeat myself for the not last time, take a lot of time to test your background fetching. Uh, schedule a lot of time for that. Uh, from that same thread, somebody who was clearly a little bit frustrated said, how many people have a whole week to spend to see if their background fetch is working? And the fantastic answer from Eskimo was, that depends on what you mean by working. Uh, <laughs> if your goal is to, and this was also from Eskimo, uh, if your goal is to test it, use Xcode Simulate Background Fetch. Uh, that works well, and that's what we did most of the time. Uh, but if you really want to see how it works in practice, you just got to wait. So for us, that meant we just had to wait. Uh, I, I had a slide in here and I took it out, but I kind of compare this a little bit to what if to test your GPS functionality, you really had to drive all around the US and take international flights to go places. That would stink, but uh, you know that is in the simulator. But I'm sure, I haven't done a lot of GPS work, but I'm guessing real world GPS situations are very different than using the simulator to switch location. Um, but at least they provide the ability to switch the location. I really hope that Apple would maybe put something in to like simulate three days of a user opening and closing apps and clearing out memory and doing all kinds of things like that. Uh, maybe if we all filed a radar or something like that would happen. But. <laughs> Uh, file access in the background. This one was one of the uh, most unexpected things for us. Uh, we, we didn't think we'd run into really big troubles about this. 
two major things is NS user defaults is not always available in the background. Um, have people experienced this on your projects? Maybe yeah, a little bit, a couple, couple head nods. Um, yeah. So like, if it was, if you opened it, and then it somehow became inactive, but then came uh, into background processing after it went inactive, uh, then then it'll work. But in other situations, it won't work. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what the consequences of that are even even in more ways later. Uh, also, your app may have created files with important data that you can't read in the background. And you did this before you thought about background processing, and you didn't set these uh, attributes on the file system, and therefore you're stuck, and you're going like, to be hitting your head going, why can't I read this file? So to do that, uh, to, to avoid that, write your files right, hopefully from the first time, uh, use that uh, complete file protection until first user of uh, attribute. Uh, what we had to do in our situation was take the files that were already on disk, read them, write them somewhere else. I think we picked a new file name. I'm guessing you could delete the old file and just rewrite it and place them. And don't just think your uh, files are the only thing. Uh, I don't know what the uh, storage mechanism is for keychain keys, but you also have to set attributes on keychain keys that you might be saving to. Uh, we did the same thing. We just moved keychain values into a whole other uh, key. A whole other key uh, value. Apple has one more thing for us, and that was that NS user defaults is sometimes not even available when you get to the foreground. Has anyone else experienced this? I am curious. I would love to talk to you all afterwards, or if you want to yell what your what your uh, workaround was, I'd love to hear. It. Still figuring it out. Still figuring it out. Hey. That's what my slide says, too. So unfortunately, to, to describe what the situation is, if you haven't run into this, uh, if your app was launched in the background, and then it gets foregrounded after that, NS user defaults may just look empty. You can make calls to it. You can try to read keys from it. But just nothing will come back. And in most cases, that means it's like your app is new. You don't know maybe what, what the selected library was, or what your favorite journals were, what, whatever it might be. <laughs> Uh, that can be really disconcerting to users because they think they've lost everything. Uh, think about what's best, what best workaround you can figure out for this situation if you run into it. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a good time. Uh, we've tried, you know, we said standard user defaults, we've tried synchronizing the user defaults just to see if that would fix it. That did not fix it. Uh, we, we adopted not a fantastic workaround uh, that basically stops the user from seeing anything really bad, but the user has to open up the app again. So at least they don't think that the app lost all of their data, uh, but they do have to launch the app again right away, unfortunately. But there's no workaround for it, so maybe we can put our heads together and figure something out. We'll see. Finally, usage tracking. Uh, this is something, uh, I guess, how many people have some sort of usage tracking in their app, you know, for counting sessions or how many times the app is opened? And, okay, what, maybe about half only. How many really rely on that for either analytics that's reported to users or just for like business insight? Okay, about the same number. So like usage tracking is really important to us. Libraries uh, purchase our product and they want information about it, like how many, uh, you know, downloads did articles from the New England Journal of Medicine get uh, at our institution? Uh, things like that. How long are people spending in the app? That sort of thing. Uh, and we really didn't think at all about how background processing was going to impact our usage tracking. Uh, we, were in, we were in a meeting totally not about background processing, and my teammate Jordan, I believe, uh, was, was just thinking about, uh, about our analytics collection, and she's like, I wonder how, I wonder what happens when we're running in the background. And we all just got quiet. We're like, uh-oh, uh, have we checked? And so we went and checked in like the staging environment we have for it. And yeah, uh, our usages were off, off the chart, like really, really wrong. And that would have been just a nightmare to try to, uh, to fix. So this was almost the really nasty dragon that blew our city away. 
Uh, and we would have had to like somehow extract which sessions were in the foreground, which were in the background, you know, which, which sessions did a human actually create uh, or not. Uh, this was the difference. Like it was over a 10x difference. Uh, like I said, we were trying to fire roughly once an hour, and so it, <laughs> if our typical usage was that blue line at the bottom, and then we released notifications, and it would have jumped to orange, we'd been really excited for a day, and then we would have gone like, why did it jump that much? Uh, and we would have felt really bad and had to clean up a big data mess. Uh, another interesting thing. Uh, we are tracking analytics when the app runs in the background. Uh, so we're still like firing off certain events like, oh, were we able to connect to the server right? Uh, were we able to download the data that we wanted? Uh, was, was there new articles for a user? That sort of thing. Uh, and that's been really helpful just so that we know like, how many people are benefiting from our background processing uh, and also when are things broken or when might things be behaving in a way that we don't want it to. Uh, but because we're recording it, that orange line shows the background sessions, and I guess I don't have the days of the week on here, but it's Monday through, actually Sunday and Saturday on the outside. It seems like background processing runs less frequently on the weekends. I don't know if that's an Apple thing or an iOS thing or like our users, but that, that was an interesting uh, learning from all of this. So just avoid skewing your metrics, and depending on what analytics library you're using, whether it's uh, homegrown, uh, some third party that you're adopting, you just have to test it out. Because uh, we've tried a few different libraries, and each one worked differently. Uh, some of them were smart enough to just go, oh, it's background, I'm not going to count it. And that's kind of smart, but you might also want to collect those metrics when it's in the background. So just test it out. So we slayed the dragons that we needed to. We got it out after many months of uh, testing and trying things out. So what did we learn from it? Uh, the best thing was that notifications did what we wanted it to. It increased usage of our app. Uh, probably not a big shocker to anyone, but it's something that we had been like, kind of, kind of kicking the can down for a little while um, to actually get implemented because we weren't sure, you know, is pushed the right way, especially on the Android side of things. We we should feel very happy about how push works on iOS because on Android they've had basically three different things, three different ways to do push notifications, uh, and it's not even the same if, say, you're on like an Amazon device uh, or I'm sure a handful of other like non-real core Android devices. So thankfully we have things pretty good for push notifications uh, over over in the iOS world. Uh, but hey, increased usage! Hooray! We got the gold. Uh, but here was the like semi shocker: is that Android notifications get tapped on a lot more than iOS. Uh, for the folks working on dual uh, platform apps, are you seeing that as well? Maybe you haven't. It would be interesting to check it out because um, this was very surprising to us. Uh, we did look online. There's a variety of articles that talk about it, and online, uh, this this is standard. Android gets more taps. I think the iOS 12 uh, notification changes, I bet, are addressed to, uh, like, designed to address this. So I put uh, Legolas and Gimli on here just, just to give you a warning. Like, if you roll this out and you're, you're talking with your Android colleagues and you're thinking to yourself, our notifications are going to get tapped on so well, uh, d don't have like the orc kill count like uh, Gimli and Legolas have. Because you're not going to win if you're on iOS right now. And the usage stats that I was talking about for background processing were really helpful. Uh, the beacons are so lit. Uh, we, we basically now have a, a system, sort of like the, the, the beacons of Gondor, or whatever they're called, uh, to, to let us know if something bad is going on in the wild. Uh, that, was, that was a really good thing that I'm glad we did uh, implement at the end, you know, at, at the last minute when we realized usage metrics might get skewed. And here's what the actual uh, like change was. Uh, our sessions per user without notifications are in blue, so that's the old, the old way. Uh, these are the same version of the app, but not all users have opted in for notifications. Uh, we do you know, ask, ask them and, and try to make sure we're not being obnoxious to the user. Uh, but everybody that went in with notifications, at least on average, they're opening the app 20% more often. Woo! That's great. 
Uh, and also, really interestingly, uh, the screens per session are down a little bit, but not that much. Uh, and that's really good, because that's exactly what we want. We want a researcher to be told, like, there's five new articles in New England Journal of Medicine today. They open it, they look at them, they go, I don't care about those five. And then they get out of the app. Uh, so hopefully they're opening it up more frequently, handling a smaller amount of work, and then getting out, rather than being faced with 200 unread messages like we all hate to see in our email. Similarly, articles downloaded is another big metric that we track, and that also increased uh, right along with like the number of sessions that uh, people were doing. So not only are they seeing the articles, but they're also downloading more articles. And hopefully we're uh, expediting the speed of science and you know social sciences and arts and humanities research because of that, you know, just even if just by a little bit. So the major lessons that we learn, schedule at least three times more time to test than typical. And I might even boost that up more. Uh, you know, like five. Use your resources sparingly for your app. Try to use as little RAM and other work as possible. Watch out for the files not being available in the background and make sure you port them. Uh, do not forget your usage stats. And expect fewer notification taps on iOS than Android. Thanks so much. You can check out our company uh, at thirdiron.com. Our product is at browsine.com. You can download the apps, try them out. There's a free version if you're not at a university. But if you are associated with a university, uh, you know, have like an email or something, you can try it out. Uh, give me feedback. I'd love to hear about it. Follow on Twitter or who, who's on Mastodon? It's like, yeah, not many of us. <laughs> but, uh, I guess that's the URL you have to go to if you want to kind of be invited to Mastodon. They're working on their... I guess ergonomics uh, right now, but hope to see you on one of those. Thanks a lot. Any questions at all?